Hey everybody, this is Scott Bowman. I'm the creator behind Idea Brickworks, and this is our episode eight of the um, Brick Building Together Apart. And uh, I'm really, really excited about today's show. Um, I've got the great builder, uh, Aaron Frissom, uh, and I am super excited. I knew Aaron from uh, Iowa, although it's funny, we had to go to Chicago to meet because um, the first time I met him was at Brick World, and I think it was 2014. Were we showing the Science Center when you were there? Uh, my first Brick World was 2015, I think. Okay, so it's probably the year after we did that. Yeah, yeah, that was the first time. So I, I just remember. First. Chris Hettinger, who is uh, the co-founder of the Iowa Lug, came over and said, ah, there's this guy from Ankeny. He's got this incredible build. You got to go see it. And uh, so we didn't even know that the three of us didn't know that we all existed in the same place. So so I'm super excited uh, about that. And so let's let him um, introduce himself. And by the way, Sam's here. Hi, Sam. Hello. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, Aaron Fiskum, um, uh used to build with Lego often as a child. I think probably till about the age of 12, I was really interested in castle and, and uh, space sets. I think, you know, that was kind of the traditional thing for for Lego, Lego builders at the time because I'm kind of an old man. Right? I was back uh, in the 80s. <laughs> and then uh, I didn't start building again, I think, until around my 38th or 39th birthday. I was out shopping for... Uh, gifts for a niece and a nephew and uh, was walking down the toy aisles and saw how far a Lego had really come and and while I picked them up a set or two I picked myself up a couple sets as well and that kind of started that uh, love of building again so and, you uh, here I am. <laughs> so you did have a dark period I did yes yeah many years <laughs> well cool so uh, what are you going to do today as far as just here with you, I hope uh, have an awesome show with you. Uh, talk a little bit about Lego builds you've done, builds I've done, uh, things we're doing in the community, and uh, okay. anything else you want. Okay. Well, I just you know we build. I thought I told you this. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, uh, let me put this. I'll put um, myself back on the screen. So I, I don't know when I got this, but I know I didn't get it when it was first new. Oh. Um, and anybody that knows me knows I'm into cars and specifically into racing. Um, I think this actually came out. It's the V8, so it's got to be in the, what, mid-2000s era of, um, uh, of Formula One. And it, it, I think this is somewhat modeled after the Williams, but just never got badged that way. Um, just looking at the, the genesis of it. Anyway, I've had this for a long time. And so th that's my project for today is I'm going to put this together. And Sam, you're stuck without a Lego set. Yep. I'm just going to have to control myself so I don't open the ones that are behind me. But I've got some uh, stuff I'm going to do in studio today as well. So, Right. Um, and we have some um, some regulars, quote unquote, in the, 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 uh, <laughs> in, in the process. So let's um, add Mr. Chambers. Hi, Joe. How's it going? Good. And you are working on Skylab today? I'm working on my one to seventy-three scale Skylab. I've been I put it on hold for a little while, waiting for parts, and I kind of got distracted with another project. But yeah, I'm uh, yeah. working on the prototype build for that. Okay, and then we also have Peter. Hi, Peter. Oh, you're muted. All right, there you go. Hello. Hello, what are you going to do today? Uh, I basically have a lot of sorting to do. 
for ever so sort of everyone's just being really boring today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. What the heck? Oh, yes, of course. No intentionally. <laughs> Thanks for your support. What a crew I've acquired. I'm not quite sure about this. <laughs> a crew? Hold Posse? on now. <laughs> well, I thought it, we might as well get right into it. So let me pick a topic. So I would like you to tell me about this, Aaron. Oh yeah, sure. So <laughs> yeah, that's 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 uh, my favorite build of all time, I guess. So so when I when I kind of came back into the fold of building, um, which was which was the very very end of 2013, beginning of 2014, after the holiday season, there um, it was really kind of just picking up a couple of Star Wars sets here and there. And um, as I started browsing around the web, I didn't realize how large the culture of Lego got, um, you know, globally. It's it's just, it, it, it's, it's like something that's kind of, I guess, always been there, but maybe not everybody sees. And, right. and um, you know, very, very naive to that. But looking at what other people were doing, with pieces and parts that I had never seen before um, because of that dark age, I guess, if you will. It was fascinating to me to see what people were doing. And as I, as I started kind of, you know, trial and erroring some mocks, I, I put together a, 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 I guess, a TIE fighter um, with what I had. And it, it came out okay, but it sure wasn't as spectacular as some of the other stuff that, that was out there. And so I, you know, kind of thinking about, well, uh, where are they getting all of these elements, et cetera, doing research, BrickLink, BrickOwl. There's a lot of, um, you know, uh, there's a huge third-party market out there to, to get pieces. And so I, I thought, well, as I'm looking around and I'm looking at these different things, um, you know, what what is really inspiring? What What's what's not been done uh, in this in this genre of building? And, and this happened to be it. I hadn't seen a a UCS scale model um, of the land speeder. And, and this, you know, as far back as I can remember as a, as a semi Star Wars fan, this is the first hover car I ever wanted to drive. You know, um, just this kind of a, a really spectacular, uh, spectacularly shaped model. And so I, I started prototyping and, and started putting it together. I was using LDD at the time because I didn't have the pieces. And this was. This was late 2014. I think I started on the design in November. By the time things rolled around in December, I had mostly completed it. And that's what it looked like right there. And it certainly wasn't done. Uh, obviously, the, the windshield was not uh, completed. <laughs> and there were some other design tweaks that I did. But I submitted this on a dare. Um, uh, through, my wife, Bethany, said, you know, you should put this out there. So this would be really neat. Let's just see what happens. And I said, well, okay. Um, and I didn't really know what it meant to do it when I did it. <laughs> Obviously, I hadn't done my research. I didn't really know, you know, the, the I wasn't well versed in the platform of ideas and, and how, you know, broad and widespread it was. And, and immediately it, it got about 4,000 supporters. And I thought, well, this is not a finished model and I better get on it. So I did a lot of updating to it. In fact, if you, if you hit the updates page, you can see that the stand changed. There were some design changes in the build itself. Um, that's the end product right there. And that, that's really what, uh, what I ended up with. Would there be other things I would like to do? Sure. Well, I was a novice when I did this. So the inside of this is very, very ugly. It, it, it truly is. And I'll be honest with everybody here. It's, 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 I think six by eight Technic brick all stuck together on the inside. And then uh, the same thing on the underside, just flattened together with some beams and, and other things and pins. And, and, um, so it was more visual, it, right? It wasn't, right. The outside was so much better looking than the inside, um, which is, I guess, the most important part about it. 
but uh, ultimately through a little uh, you know help from social media, um, I think the first person to blog this was uh, Tommy Williamson uh, of Brick Nerd fame, right? Um, he picked this up, and then um, the uh, Paul Strauss at the Awesomer Media had uh, had picked it up and, and wrote about it on on um, on his uh, theawesomer dot com website. Uh, he has a number of different sites out there uh, that he does work with for for geek stuff and toys and, and cool stuff. So I guess this was considered cool stuff by by Tommy and Paul. And then um, ultimately, the first time I had this shown somewhere was at uh, Planet Comic Con in Kansas City. And, and thanks to Sean Kelly of the um, Kansas City Lug, he invited me down to show with them at, at Comic Con. And so I, I did that. And that's when it really started to open my eyes. Um, and he said, you know, there are other shows you should probably go to. And uh, Chicago would be the next big one. Maybe you should head to Chicago. And I think that's where I met you and Chris. Yep. So, and, and there you have it. And and again, not knowing the culture, getting there, not really understanding what it was all about. And then, you know, I got lucky. Um, I, I took home best land vehicle at that particular show. Uh, and it was kind of about that time where I realized how closely knit the community was. And, you know, you get to know that people came over and introduced and, and I got to know a lot of people just in probably the last two hours of the day. Um, and yeah, I met Tim Courtney of Ideas. He happened to be there, luckily enough, for a, uh, uh, a presentation. Right. And uh, I, I met him and we've gotten to know each other over the years. Uh, obviously we weren't close when this was going through Ideas, but after, um, after his time with, uh, with Ideas, he and I have, uh, have uh, kept in touch. And a really, really good guy. Yeah, so it was fun. It was a great experience for me. And then ultimately, I think a year later, it hit 10,000 when it picked up speed again. And um, there you have it. I think the highlight, though, of all of this was having the model displayed at the Lego house uh, during the first anniversary. Um, uh, Junhen Wong had sent me pictures. He happened to be there that day. Uh, he's a builder, I think, out in Singapore. I'm not mistaken. Um, and a very, very big fan of Lego. He had sent me pictures that day of them just finishing the display. There were 18 10,000 club uh, models that got chosen for the, the display case that they had. And it was it was spectacular. It was a, a branching display case with all of these different displays. I'm sure you guys probably saw it if you saw videos of the, of the, the birthday. Right. Of that. And um, that you know, I probably should have traveled there, but I was too busy working on other builds to get there and other things. So. Um, there you have it. Yeah. yeah, that that was not a smart move, Aaron. Um, no, I know. I should have went. I should have. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that. Yeah, I I will confirm that was stupid. No, I know. I know. I should have been bill and bound, but I wasn't. That's right. Especially now, you know, it's like um, I've kind of promised my uh, youngest daughter that we're going to go to the uh, to uh, Denmark, just mm -hmm. father daughter, and definitely get to. Um, bill and, and get there and try and get the inside tour, which we can apply for in January. And okay. typically, you know, by um, February, whether you got got the tickets or not. Oh, it, it takes that much. <laughs> and then, it, well, then you have to go at the time of the tour. It's like, <laughs> it's like March or can't remember exactly when it is, but um, it's well worth going. I know quite a few people that have gone. And uh, and then, of course, I don't know quite as many people as you do, Aaron, but I do know a few. And so it would be fun to uh, see a lot of those folks Definitely. in their natural habitat. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Natural habitat. So back back to credit. I mean, all credit credit where it's due. It was it was Bethany, my wife. Um, she, she was responsible for all of it. So um, kudos to her for uh, pushing me along and uh, really pushing me to go to that first brick world. Now she was not your um, your wife at the time, correct? No, she was not. Yeah, so, but she is now. And happy to, happy to say so. <laughs> and, and speaking, um, if you follow. Um, Aaron, 
I, I must say that uh, he does win the um, – no, there's no winning, but he definitely married up. Let's just put it that way. Oh, yeah, she's better than I deserve. Yeah. No, yeah. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. I think everybody agrees. Yeah. Um, and I, one of the things I was curious about, we talked a little bit about this when we were getting ready, that um, she is uh, deaf, correct? Yes, she is. Yep. And so how did you guys, I know this isn't Lego guys, but it's life, right? Um, how did you guys meet? So that's a great, great question. So uh, speaking to her deafness, she lost her hearing at, just before the age of two, I believe, due to spinal meningitis when she was a kid. Um, during a really, really, really heavy blizzard, I want to say it was 76 or 77. Um, no, maybe it was even earlier than that. No, no, it was, yeah, about 70, I think it was 77. Um, we were both from North Dakota. And um, I think I was born in 74. Or, well, I won't say when she was born. Uh, you're not supposed to do that with the ladies. You're a wise man, um, yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, that, that, that occurred and she, she became very sick. And, and due to um, the appointment and meningitis, she, she, her auditory nerve was scarred. And, and, uh, she was profoundly deaf. Um, but uh, she's come a long way and is really kind of a trailblazer, I think. Um, it, it is, it, you know, as a part of the deaf community, uh, and it's very important that I say these words in the right order. Um, she's the first deaf pharmacist in the United States with a doctorate mm. registered with the Board of Pharmacy. There are other deaf pharmacists out there that have doctorates as well. I think there are four or five of them that came after her. Um, but that's not to say that there weren't some deaf pharmacists before that either. Um, she was just the first to be registered with the Board of Pharmacy. So um, we, uh, we uh, ultimately, coming back to the, the question, we, we were a year, I was a year ahead of her in, in high school uh, when her uh, family moved to Grand Forks, North Dakota, which is where I was, I was from, where I was raised. Um, and uh, she, she, I believe, was the only deaf student uh, at, at the high school at the time. So I was a junior, she was a sophomore. Um, we didn't really know each other at the time. I think we knew each other enough to wave hello in the hallway. Um, and ironically enough, we shared one class together. Uh, it happened to be speech class. So I will always remember her speech with the signing. And because I didn't know sign language, of course, which was kind of a language barrier, but she did have an interpreter, so she, she did that. And then my she remembered my speech because um, uh, I, I, <laughs> I used a couple of people from the audience and uh, broke some bricks and boards. I did a, a speech on various martial arts. So, um, but I think I think we both made an impact on each other there for sure. Um, and we didn't meet again until later in life. And it wasn't until I was coming back from New England. I had been out in the Boston area for 99 through mid 2013. Um, just happened to friend uh, friend me on Facebook, and uh, we formed a really fast friendship. I was living in Minneapolis at the time, which is about three hours away from where I am now. And uh, over the course of, of you know, seven, eight months um, of becoming friends, it just, it just kind of worked out. I came down here, I surprised her, I visited her. I don't think she was ready for me to come here yet. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, was a, it was a big surprise for her. And then um, uh, she said, uh, you know, I'll, 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 uh, I'll come up and see you and surprise you at some point. And so uh, it was August. My birthday was in September and um, she certainly surprised me. Uh, came up. I was, I was planning to go out to dinner with my mother and father and one of my aunts for that birthday. And uh, I canceled those plans because Bethany called and said, I have, a, I have a surprise for you. So I went into the city and uh, she had a whole itinerary planned out. We had two different dinners to go to and, and deserted this other place. And, and it was just a lot of fun. And um, thereafter, we became a couple, I think, in October and um, got married in 2016. So there you have it. So how did you guys end up in Des Moines? Was, did she go to pharmacy school at Drake? So she came here with her family in well, her senior year of high school. So she finished high school here. So that oh. was in 93, 94, was it 94? Yeah, 93, 94. And then um, from here, she went to Gaudet University out in 
Washington, D.C., College for the Deaf, School for the Deaf. Um, she stayed there for a year or so and then came back and decided to go to the uh, University of Iowa, not Iowa State, University of Iowa, in uh, the Cedar Rapids area, Iowa City. And um, um, I think at first, she, 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 I think she knew she wanted to do pharmacy, um, but, and I probably, I don't know how much detail I should go into. I know the school wasn't certain about having a deaf student uh, uh, to, to, to do pharmacy because of the, the nature of the job. You're, you're interacting with patients all the time and, and their, their worry was the, communi the, the communication right. barrier. Right? But um, ultimately they let her in and, and she, you know, she's kind of shown the world that um, it's possible. So, yeah. And then I'll, I'll forgive so she, her. She, she, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I said, I'll forgive her for going to the University of Iowa. Yeah. <laughs> it's unfortunate, but I do know, you know. That She's a hot guy. For sure. And and so that, that's that. So she's been here since. She's University been here. of Iowa. Yeah. We, it's a loving, well, not so loving uh, rivalry. Yeah. Her, her, uh, her father is an Iowa Stater. So I, 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 know, I, I, know, the, I know the rivalry very well. Yeah, yes. <laughs> so what do you do in your day job? Um, by trade, I guess I was a software engineer. Um, ultimately, I, I went on to um, That's not a software development teams over time. And then I could see where IT was going um, faster, better, more. Um, and, and I decided that I had, there was a, I was looking to leave a job that I was currently in, and one of the one of the upper management caught wind. Uh, one of the vice presidents caught wind and asked if I wanted to come to work as a as a, a technical program project manager. And I said sure, you know. And, and and she said if you know try it for a year. If you don't like it, then then take off and and you know find a find a different uh, career or, or or spot someplace else. And I said okay. And from there, it kind of grew, and a lot of what I've done now over the last, I suppose, eight or nine years has been program management, client engagement, and um, cost modeling for IT efforts uh, in the space that we provide services for. So it's, it's very interesting. I work for CompuCom Systems um, out of the Carolinas. So, so you're totally... I'm, I'm what? I'm sorry? You're totally remote. You de you're I am. I am totally remote. remote. Yes, I've been. I've been a remote associate since 2010, April of 2010, as a matter of fact. Oh. And that that flexibility has helped me move easily, which is which has been very fortunate. Coming back to the Midwest was easy. Moving <laughs> to the Des Moines area was easy. Um, I can work from anywhere, which is which is great. Um, I think. I find myself more productive as a person. You know, if, if I if I'm if I'm off the desk to get lunch, I can I can do my laundry quickly. You know, toss it in the wash. Um, you know, th those kinds of things. Uh, but I find that I do put more hours in. I start earlier, I end later. Um, but it's it's I, I love the work. It's a great career. I really like the people I work with, and um, it's it's been fantastic. I, I, I'm very fortunate to do what I do for sure. Well, one thing I've noticed uh, since retirement or early retirement and, you know, working for myself. Um, now, that's the life right there, right? Yeah. And this is my job, you know. Right. right. Yeah, Lego is my life. Um, but um, you are kind of always working, though. That's yeah. – if there's a downside, it's that um, – now, the upside is I usually watch an episode of – whatever at lunch right sure. you know so i'm always taking an hour and and maybe a little more because you watch into the next episode right so sure. um it's it, so there are some benefits that you can kind of do your own pacing kind of thing but I, i'm not sure that you're always working aaron um what is this <laughs> well i guess i've always <laughs> I've always been a gamer, right? So starting with the Atari 2600, uh, yeah. you know, the very first Nintendo, a Super Nintendo. And then after the Super Nintendo, I got into PC gaming. That was about the time I 
I suppose I started college and was out there doing that. But yeah, this this was uh, this is a screenshot of Doom Eternal. Um, you know, just wanted to have some of the friends that I uh, used to game with salivate out there a little bit. <laughs> I brought that up on a Facebook post one day, and um, that's where I spent some uh, downtime, I guess, if you will. There you go. That is quite the rig. And by the way, that uh, that mosaic behind there is you and Bethany. Um, yes. Did you do that, or did someone? No, else no. I so, and I think we, you may show a picture of him later. I had um, another another uh, designer out there, Alan Hickman, put that together for Bethany and I for our wedding, and I, uh, we revealed that to her there um, during the um, uh, after the ceremony at the dinner. And so, yeah, that's that's sitting up there on the wall. Uh, that's that was a picture of us on our save the date card, as a matter of fact. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That makes sense. Yep. I think that's our favorite picture together. Even of the nicer ones, I still think that's our favorite picture together. Okay, so now I'm starting to make a connection. Um, I say that as I'm putting Technic brick together. But anyway, um, let me uh, find the other picture. Because this is another build. I never got to see this one in person. Um, because I had moved to Idaho by this time. Oh, yeah. And I just find this outstanding. Outstanding. This was the ID4 City Destroyer from the, the Will Smith yes. movie um, Independence Day back in the 90s. Okay. This is where I've seen your work before. Yeah. <laughs> so I can't take credit. I, I, can't, I can't take credit for all of this. So I okay. designed the saucer myself. Alan Hickman, the gentleman that did the mosaic, uh, designed the city down below. So that's, that's you know, there's Alan right there and me with that really terrible picture of me. Um, and so um, and we put this together. And we, we, to be honest with you, the first time it was fully suspended was at Brick World 2017. So... Um, Alan had, yeah, it was a real, uh, it was kind of a make or break moment. Alan had someone that he was working with to produce um, a stand for the model, and that fell through. And so um, we, we had to scramble to, to finish this up, and, and he built the stand on site the day we got there. Oh. And I can't tell you how nervous, nerve wracking that was. Um, <laughs> That's a 20,000 piece model. It's almost five feet in diameter. And, you know, the weight of that is, is not, um, is not light. And so the, the way it's put together is, is there, there are pie pieces, about eight pie pieces over the top and underneath on the bottom. And then um, the hull, right, is that eighth, that, that the, where the bridge is, is where the eighth, uh, the eighth piece is. But, um, uh, yeah, that was there, there was a skeleton in there that had eight arms that went out and then um, they were connected around the outside and You can't see it from here, but there are actual uh, translucent plates. So at night with the right light, you'll see um, And Alan did this part of it um, you'll, you'll see light coming out from around the middle of the of the saucer oh, um, Awesome, but it was yeah, it was uh, it was something it was a lot of fun and it was a real challenge, I think, to date. That's the yeah, that is the largest. I haven't built many things, but um, this was this was by far the most challenging and the most fun, I think, for sure. That is yeah, still one of you know, it's funny. It's, it's, it's like I'm buildings. you're a little like me. I either build really, really big or really, really small. Right. <laughs> I didn't get to help Alan build the island, but Alan did help me build a couple of the pie pieces up on the up on the saucer. So, do you still have that? Is it still in existence? It's, it is in existence in pieces. Uh, I think it's with Alan down in Kansas City, right now. Will it ever be shown again? I do not know. <laughs> well, especially now, right? You know. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows uh, where everything is going? But I think the, uh, I think the best part about that model outside of the city below it is the underside. I don't know if you have a picture of that or not. I don't. I tried to, I tried to replicate that as closely as I could. I, I, so 
down in this room, I had, I had a TV on the wall and, and I was watching the movie and I was trying to get every angle that I could of the ship just to get it right. And to get the underside right, I kind of had to watch it uh, move over the, the Empire State Building in the movie, right? And then pick out all the details and try to map it into LDD. And, and that, that was, um, I think that was the, outside of the skeleton, that was probably the hardest part was trying to get that right. There's so much detail in that. Anyway, yeah. That really is awesome. That's awesome. I can't believe it held up the whole weekend. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get it suspended? Did you have to get the people from the, the venue to help? Um, well, actually, it's funny that you mentioned that because there was a very slight design change uh, during the course of that show as we were trying to suspend it. So a couple of the lug members here in Iowa helped me build out another layer of plate underneath so we could accommodate that the, the, the design change and, and put that back up underneath the saucer. Um, but they had a very nerve wracking um, weekend outside of not having the the, the post to, to, to hang this thing was making sure that as we were hanging it to the post, that it was really going to work. Right. Time got the better of us. That's all I can say. <laughs> as it is always. So Aaron, you mentioned you built this in LDD as well. Yeah, 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 that was mostly where I put. Uh, I did. I did my land speeder there. I did a, a destroyer ship from the game Homeworld, and then this one as well. Okay. Uh, so I I've been getting into digital designing over the past few months, and um, I, I I've just jumped in with Breaklink Studio. But uh, I I do have a question for you since that's a rather uh, large model, and uh, well, by the looks of your PC. Um, What's your uh, graphics uh, uh, processing like? So, so admittedly, um, I was running on a machine in a custom build that was built back in 2011 when I did this. That new machine I just purchased after the first of the year. Um, okay. So, so, but that 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 runs a a, a 2080 uh, super. Um, I, I wish I would have had that when I was going to work on these kinds of things. I mean, obviously, as you grow the build larger and larger. Um, you know, your PC specs mean everything as to how fast and uh, how your patients get tested, I guess, when you're building digitally. So, <laughs> so it, it, I, it's kind of funny because I actually just bought a 2060 Super last weekend. Right on. And, uh, right the guy at Best Buy tried to talk me up to the 2080. I'm like, uh, that's a pretty big price jump. It was, I, I, to be honest with you, the, I, I I, I purchased an HP Omen. I'm actually on an HP Omen laptop right now and I have an Omen screen. Not that I'm here as an HP um, you know, commercializer or anything, uh, uh, or, or surrogate for that matter. <laughs> I, there, there was a deal, uh, if, you, if you are looking or need something new, there was a deal on Amazon at the beginning of this year for an Omen obelisk, 2080 Super, 32 gigabytes of HyperX RAM and a 9900K for under $2,000. In fact, it was sixteen hundred dollars on Cyber Monday, which is the reason I I, I picked it up. So um, uh, there you have it. Uh, I didn't get it for the Cyber Monday price, but I definitely got it at the discount price after the first year. So uh, I did build my own PC last summer, and this past week I've upgraded the graphics card and got a solid state hard drive. Right on. And uh, I. I know I knew people always said solid state is great to have your operating system on. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. And uh, <laughs> oh, Peter's ready to go in 30 seconds from the time. I, I, our button. It's so nuts. It's so nuts. I have an M2 as my primary and my secondary. And I think if I were to go back to anything else, I would be impatient. You know, I, I would yeah. be that yeah. knobby entitled kid that, Things aren't running fast enough, and, and yeah, you know, it's a world of difference. Like my my whole because uh, I do I make a lot of custom decals for my models in Bricklink Studio, so it's mm. like Photoshop opens up instantly, and then of course I make videos for YouTube and Premiere. Sure, I, I can edit Premiere video 4K videos in Premiere without dropping frames because yeah. before I would just when I had playback while editing, I get choppy and uh, would drop like a 
frame every couple seconds. And now it's like, wow, this is incredible. <laughs> it is. It's night and day. It really, really is. Um, yeah. and in fact, I, I used I used Premiere Pro on a project myself, and, and you're absolutely right. The, the state of your PC means everything, you know, in, in, in from a time saving perspective. And what was funny is because my my normal workflow was when I got done editing and I felt good about it, mm -hmm. I would have to render and export the video to make 100% sure my edits were correct. Yeah. And my my export and render time is the time I would spend designing my thumbnail in Photoshop for YouTube. <laughs> but now I can't do it because it's exporting faster than I can <laughs> even start to design a thumbnail. Awesome. Yeah, I've got a laptop that I do everything on and I'm I'm guessing that if I'm gonna keep doing the large builds, um, I do have a solid state drive, which I would never go back. Um, no doubt. It, once you have one, it's just, it makes everything so much nicer. I, I'm i just concerned about the uh, um, the lifetime because of how many times you can actually write and re write over it. So I am still keeping a, uh, a hard, physical uh, spin drive for my backup, but um, I'm, I'm sure the solid states are gonna just get better with over time. And hopefully less expensive, right? Yeah. Especially the bigger ones. So they are pricey. It, I it have a two you know, terabyte two drive for two fifty. And then I, I think the equivalent hard drive is around you could get a two terabyte drive for between a hundred and hundred and fifty. Yeah. Yeah. Quite a bit. I admittedly I I, I do have a, a storage server that I keep down here. It's a it's a uh, an eight bay raid cabinet with four green drives in it. I, I, I don't care about performance. It's running off of a, um, uh, I think it's a micro ITX board, uh, small case next to it, just for storage specifically. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm with you on that. Maybe, maybe I'm still old school, I don't know. <laughs> that, I don't know that that's old school that you have a personal server. <laughs> well, no, the, the fact that I'm using uh, two terabyte green uh, mechanical hard drives, maybe. Um, oh, oh, yeah. It's just basically a big NAS server is all it is. Yeah, yeah I think my mechanical engineering degree just ran out. <laughs> <laughs> it's where you step into what you're going to learn in the next couple of weeks, Scott, is, is, is what we're talking about now. This is what I'm going to teach you. That's true. Yes, I I'm going to be much more versed on um, digital IT networking. You name it, I'll be you. So hey, Scott, you know, I still I still dispute the the title of software engineer because us real engineers <laughs> find that very offensive. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're you're going to the penalty box, Joe. For <laughs> um, I think. Well, you know, the, the, I guess the, the the phrase "software engineer" meant something different, probably, you know, yeah. seven to ten years ago. Um, yeah. You know, now we're all just developers, I guess, right? Yeah, it's okay. I was just. Uh, <laughs> what was that? With everything, you've got software engineers, but a lot of these days as well, you've got IT engineers as well, which is like sort of the category that I fall into. Mm -hmm. But in the UK, um, I'm registered with the Institute of Engineering and Technology, but not as an engineer, okay. as a technician. All right, right. So on. I, I, you can, um, there is quite a few of us who've done apprenticeships and things like that who um, are recognised by. Our Institute of Engineering and Technology, and you can then get support from them to find jobs and to do professional development. But it's just, I don't know, for me, I felt like a little bit of a cheat. <laughs> also, um, because I, I'm part of this Institute of Engineering and Technology as such, and I've got a title of ICT Tech, and I've been, I'm an accredited technician. But I didn't do the, like the five years at university or whatever and an engineering degree. Well, I, I, I went straight to work and earn money. But yeah, and, and that's okay. I mean, I don't, I don't know that you know. So I do have a bachelor of science in computer science, 
but and this is not to knock college. I just, I just, I have, you know, some of the most bright, some of the brightest people I've met and worked with, you know, have don't, don't have that. And, and, you know, I don't think one should be judged um, solely on education alone. I think experience has a lot to do with it. And, and I think that one thing that was not, um, at least when I was growing up in the industry, one of the things that wasn't, um, held it as a highest standard was the tinkerers, the people that went out there and really learned about PCs. I mean, you could have a software engineer that could write code on a PC, but does he really know the inside of the PC? Mm. You know, and 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 I always found that um, when I would interview candidates, at least for for people I was hiring when I when I had a couple of development teams, um, I really looked for that. And it wasn't so much the formal education as it was, what have you done? And what can you show me? Mm. I always called it. I, I wanted engineers that had a life. <laughs> you know, because we, uh, you know, and I, you know, I spent most of my career um, working with clients. You know, uh, sure. And and frankly, that's where you get successful in consulting engineering is, you know, working with the clients and being a project manager and all that and. Uh, by having other interests, by knowing or doing other things, it allows you to connect to people in a way that um, you wouldn't be able to otherwise. And so, <clears throat> you know, I can remember I was taught by a lot of my core practical engineering by a couple of technicians. And I, they were incredible. In fact, I ended up hiring one when I had a chance. Um, I went back and hired him because I wanted him in in my team, you know. Sure. The, so technicians are undervalued and underrated, frankly. I, I think you make a good point about broadening your horizons and, and trying other things and, and meeting other people because your perspectives on other industries, you know, will really help you in whatever industry you're centric in, you know. Because if you're if you're if you're a tools development company, if you don't have the experience in those other industries, how do you really know what to build? Sure, someone can bring you requirements, and they can tell you this and that, but without you know, there, there's a lot of assumed knowledge that, that doesn't get that doesn't get placed in a requirements document sometimes. And and I think Scott, to your point, to to be able to get out there and, and be on the swivel a little bit, right, and learn more about other areas of business, it really helps you, especially in the technology field of technology, because it's so diverse. Uh, it helps you build better solutions, it helps you build things that are more um, uh, centric to what other people are asking for, right? I always, you know, people would ask, because um, I, I think I can safely state I've had a successful career, and they, they ask me, you know, what, why do you think I, you know, why do I feel I was successful? And one of the things that I always say is that I'm curious. Um, so when I get a new client, I get a new project or something I've never done before. For sure. <clears throat> I want to know more. I want to learn more about how they do their business. Because frankly, sometimes the problem isn't a new building. It isn't a new system. And so, um, being interested in the whole client, interested in the whole aspect of what they're doing is, uh, to me, that's that's critical to the way we do things. Right? No doubt. Yeah, and uh, degrees are, aren't, all, uh, aren't always necessary because I have two engineering degrees and they still won't let me drive a locomotive. <laughs> <laughs> really? We're going to go there. <laughs> did you go? Wait a second. It, 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 this isn't the degree I was I was promised. I, I think I it was a senior design seminar. <laughs> I right. suppose when we when we say engineer, the context really plays into that, doesn't it? Yeah, it really sure. does. Yes. Yeah, like the day before graduation, I was like, uh, "Is this when we get to get on the train?" Or <laughs> so on that note, uh, we have another guest. <laughs> going to join us um and joe chambers will be really excited about this person it's sam bradford Woo! hey sam hello hey. welcome to doing? 
the, the, I know the that reason Sam is here, though. He, he wants to see. He wants to see his monstrosity brought to life. Oh, <laughs> yes. Good. Hold on one second. Whoops. Can you guys still hear me? Particularly. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you, Joe. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so this is this is just not right. I'm not quite sure what. What? Anyway. Is that your drivetrain? <laughs> well, part of it. Yeah. And that's got this really unique part that you can spin the top or it, it, you can spin the bottom, but they're not physically connected. Uh, that's quite a common piece in the Technic stuff because I've seen that quite a few times on um, some of the other builds that I've got at home. Um, I think I've seen it in the cargo plane and the crane, the Mark II crane they had. Interesting. Technic fanboy from back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> Admittedly, the only thing I've really had a chance to play with are the brick and beams. I haven't gotten into power functions or um, I guess maybe I touched a couple of of uh, shock absorbers through some builds in Star Wars, but yeah. Right. Yeah, me neither. I never really tried to build in Technic. Um, I love to build Technic, but I treat it like, I don't know, I, as a kid I did plastic models. And to me doing the Porsche or doing um, like the, the Creator Series cars, to me is like doing a model. Yeah. And, I love it. I love that process. I love the sense of accomplishment. Um, and I don't feel like I need to to do it um, in quite the same way. So sadly, I found out recently there are different types of motors in Lego slash Technic because I had a quite a bit of the powered up powered function motors. And then uh, I had a gift certificate for lego.com from a contest. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to get the Technic Hub so I can control these. And uh, I got the Technic Hub. And it's like, yeah. Bluetooth control with your phone. And I'm like, oh, I can even program and all these different things. Right. And then I found out they do not connect. No. <laughs> you got to get a Technic motor to uh, connect to the Technic Hub. Not a power motor. Interesting. Okay, good to know. So I have battery boxes and the powered up motors. I have, I think, four four powered up motors and a Technic hub that doesn't talk. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna oh. have to get some Technic motors on my next order. So there's uh, some guy on the uh, bricks in space group who was actually able to take. I think he said he used half my crawler, NASA crawler design, and and um, what's his name? Help me out here. Grant Passmore took took those two designs, yeah. and he was actually able to motorize it. I still need to take a look at it, but I think I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I asked people if if it was possible at all to do that, and they're like, mm, not enough room. Okay, so Scott, do you mind if I show this off for a second? No, it's all. Oh, no, I tell you what, Joe, I'm going to put you full screen as well. Okay, so I have to, I have to say this is uh, this is Sam Bradford's design, but uh, I'm well, from that track, track yeah. Very nice. So that's uh, that's my LUT tower, and then. Launch Complex 39 here is uh, is Sam's design, and I'm wow. doing a test build for it. That's gorgeous. Yeah, and uh, I was very very nervous last night uh, <laughs> putting the LUT on top of it. <laughs> it looks but, great. Uh, did you want to see anything in particular, Sam? <laughs> Not really. I mean, I just still. So Still so surprised that the pillars line up so well. 
Yeah. With as much wrestling as we did. Yeah. And I was really surprised in your design that, like, it gets... Okay, I want to know, how did they get a tanker truck on top of the platform? Uh, they got, they got okay. this thing. It's a fascinating thing called a crane. Okay. Okay, smartass. <laughs> Glad we're not children rated. Here, let me let the electrical engineer teach the mechanical engineer something. This is called a crane, Scott. It's one of the fundamental machines. Yeah, it's a fundamental machine. Yeah. It lifts uh -oh. things. Very cool. Anyway, sorry. Uh, I have to say I'm a little bit jealous of, of Peter's and Scott's sorting um, setup here. Yeah. <laughs> my, 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 I'm terrible. My sorting consists of a, a huge tote with, um, well, they're sorted individually into Ziplocs, but that, that's as far as I've gone. I haven't so taken it all the way like you guys have. I probably so you're still in the Chris Hedinger style of story. <laughs> Yeah, just not quite as many loose pieces. <laughs> Miner, I think one, one, one third of his house, no, I would say probably a fourth of his house was, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All totes of Lego. Of course, wow. he ran, helped run the lug, too. So he kept all of that. Yeah, his basement is incredible. These are, uh, I'm saving these. These are for Scott for Christmas. It's uh, my collection of one by one plates. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh. This is a uh, number one used part. And that's why he hates them so much. <laughs> I, I, that's what I'm known in the community is I hate one by one. <laughs> Sorry, I oh, guess I didn't, I, I didn't hear that about you. Like, what, uh, <laughs> why don't you like one by ones? Yeah, I, I had no know. idea. Really? Are you being honest or so? No, I'm being absolutely serious. Okay. Um, so, as somebody that does kits and does mosaics, I like to be in control. And if you have a one by one, I have no control over your placement. Sure and the rotation and so the first saturn five had and i'm on my sixth design by the way i've okay. just I just started designing it a sixth time um oh boy the first version had maybe a couple thousand one by ones in it um uh, and when i designed it the second time uh, I got rid of all but four of them. Only, in the final Saturn V, there are only four one-by-one one bricks, and they are inside. You can't actually see them. Sure. They're not on the outside. So if they're on the inside, I'll use one-by-one, uh, although I tend to use uh, – I kind of like Lego. I've adopted that if it's inside and you never see it, I use one-by-one one round. Because again, yep. a they're a little cheaper, but they're uh, they they don't. I am still in control as the designer. That can that can provide you with some flexibility too with piece placement, right? And taking up some at least I've found and I've learned through others that one by one rounds really help out with specific mm -hmm. angles when you need to have a edge of a brick sticking in somewhere where it normally wouldn't. That one by round you know, it saves the day, you know. For sure. This is a perfect example of trying to get, let's see if I can get this position right. Everything's backwards. So I, I did not want this to be rectilinear. And so in order to get this and to get it solid, there are one by ones that they're rotated around and then a, a couple of tiles that kind of hold it in place. So yeah, exactly. It's like the the rounds give you some latitude you wouldn't necessarily. So, Scott, how many? Not that I want to turn the tables on you here, but how many kits have you uh, put out there? For sale? 
Uh, right now, my count is um, somewhere around 6,000 kits are in people's hands. Wow. Um, I saw Sam starting to smile really big there. <laughs> <laughs> um, there you go. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's kind of an amazing number. And then I thought, well, yeah, it's all because of the uh, Saturn V's for the projects. But frankly, that is still only 3,000 of it. So I was going to say individual kits, what's your number? Well, that's 6,000 that are in people's hands. And 3,000 of them were part of the Saturn V moonshots. So, I'm sorry, I probably should have said designs, my bad. Oh, number of designs. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know what it is, Sam. Is it like 10, 24? That's a good I mean, thing. I got, right? I, I'm typing as quick as I can. Okay. <laughs> is there um, a website that you could cross-reference? Uh, conveniently, there is. I mean, it's down on the ball. <laughs> but if you know, the problem is they're not all available on all platforms. Like, I don't have a good job of my... Uh, website doesn't necessarily show everything that I have made. And then if you factor in the commissions I've done, um, mm -hmm. that, uh, our kits, you know, so like I've got a mud pump, That's cool. which is a petrochemical device. Looks like this um, for Cameron. Um, they, I've done 500 of them for them in three different orders they've made. Whoa. The latest one for them is a blowout preventer. <laughs> I've done work with those. Neat. You know, it's really funny. I was at Brick Slopes, probably the year I met you, um, Joe. Uh -huh. uh, and the guy from Wyoming, and his name is escaping me now. Um, he came up to my table and, and people had been looking at the mud pump, but didn't know what, and he says, Oh my God, that's a mud pump. And it turned out he had worked with one for like 30 years. And, uh, so I ended up, I said, as long as you don't tell anybody, I sold him one of the, the ones that I made for my, you know, cause I make one as an example for myself so I can show people, but, uh. And of course, that does bring up another topic. Let me uh, that uh, we share because uh, Aaron does share this weird thing about doing lots and lots of work for very little money. <laughs> uh, kind of a labor of love, I guess. Uh, something like that. Um, I just call it a compulsion. So My wife calls it an addiction, but you know. Yeah, I know. So <laughs> tell me about brick formation. Sure. So brick formation, obviously, that's a Kevin Hinkle logo. He did a great job on that. This was this was kind of started by a gentleman by the name of Justin Nolan, and and he brought me and and uh, another person, Dominic Grusmacher, together. Uh, he, Justin and Dominic own a BrickLink store out there, a very, very large one. And they were looking to do some custom builds. And we started talking about things and we threw some ideas back and forth. And we thought, well, geez, why don't we just go for license sets and just see what happens? Um, I wouldn't say it was experimental because we, I mean, even though it kind of was, we, we really put our heart and soul into it. Um, and one of the things I know that at least be, me being a gamer and loving Homeworld since 1999 when it was first released, people had you know made a number of different models that were out there, and others had been screaming for for Lego sets of, of this stuff. And so we thought, why not? Let's give it a shot. So back in 2017, I had a build um, that that was it's a larger version of the one that's up there on top, that Hagar and Destroyer, and that was about 12,000 pieces. And I showed it at Brickworld 20. 16. No, it was 2016, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, maybe. I think this is the one. Yeah, that's the one. That, yeah, that's the one. Um, so 
Uh, that 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 caught the attention of the development team at Gearbox Software uh, because they remastered the game in 2015, and uh, um, I happened to be as a result of, uh, due to Alan Hickman um, and, and that collab we did. Um, I was down in Dallas at the time and I had that with me, and they uh, a couple of the developers were going to drop by and see it. Unfortunately, it didn't happen, and then they invited me into the studio the next day. And so they asked me to bring that along, and that wasn't an easy feat, but we did it. And uh, they kept that in their uh, their corporate headquarters for a little bit on display, which is pretty nice. Um, and uh, through that, uh, a year and a half, two years later, um, you know, we, we we chose Homeworld at Brick Formation to go for, and and with through that relationship, uh, ultimately put together a, a, a license contract, and and we went we went forward with it. It was it was very very interesting. Uh, very interesting experience, uh, and, and probably, I wouldn't say it was more than I was ready for, but, it, I, you know, me still being new to that community, um, I didn't know how well received it would be, uh, but it's, it's been a great, it's been a great, uh, great experience for me, and a lot of fun, uh, especially from the design perspective, so when we, when we jumped into this, um, I had designed the first three sets that we did, as well as the instructions. Uh, for those sets. Um, I had a friend, a couple of friends that, that were actually professionals help out with our work um, on the boxes and, and things like that. And we, we branded ourselves with that look. Um, obviously, uh, Gearbox had a lot of say into what it needed to look like and how things were put together, right? But each one of those models that we produced were, were approved um, by them. Uh, we've only got nine of them out there so far. Uh, the the contract we have with them lasts only a certain amount of time, and so we we've done the best we can to produce what we could. Um, I think we're going to end at the end of this year, but uh, again, a, gr a great experience. Um, so the first three models, which was the Hagar and Faction, um, I put together kind of solely on my own. I had help from the Iowa Lug guys um, in testing those builds, um, and I'll tell you, instructions can be a very, very difficult thing to do, <laughs> especially for larger models. We, the, the smallest one there is 500 pieces, and well, the, uh, the first three, and the largest one was, was about 1,400, I think. I'd have to go back and take a look. But to, to do that, it was, a, it was a very, very steep learning curve for me to, 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 to get that done. Um, so Chris, Chris Hedinger, uh, Doug Kinney and Mike Gonzo Gonzalez were my three test builders from Iowa Lug. They helped me out quite a bit. Of course, I had to feed them pizza and drinks, <laughs> but it was, it was good, and they gave me a lot of great feedback, and, and we went forward uh, with the builds. Uh, thereafter, the second wave of sets, um, I knew that I couldn't do it on my own. I didn't want to, and um, so, so I recruited a few, to, to, a few people to help. Um, so we got Tim Schwolfenberg, and I know he's known for his space builds and his home world builds. He did a couple of the bagger faction for us. Um, I had Pete Mowry. Uh, he's also known for his, his custom work. He's got a, a couple of really, really, I mean, well, actually a lot. He's done a lot of building, much more than I ever have. Um, but I've seen him. We, we've met at Brick World, and that's how we got to know each other. Uh, Artsy Karpinski, who's a modeler um, overseas out of Russia. Uh, Pierre Kruger out of the Netherlands. And then Stefan Garcia also um, did some models for us. Uh, um, uh, Cushion Faction. He actually already had a little bit of fame in the homeworld space uh, and, and, and in the Lego space because of homeworld, because he put together a modification for the video game called Brick Space, where instead of using the ships that come with the game, you're playing with brick built ships um, that are Lego based in the game. It's very, very cool. Huh. So if you're a fan of homeworld, and you haven't played Brick Space, you should do that. Load it up, give it a shot. Very cool, very cool stuff. So how did you do your instructions? What was, what was your tool of choice? So um, there were a couple, of, well, so, so in the second series, I have to give credit where it's due. I, um, I, I made a friend over time, and he goes by the alias Edgeless Abyss, um, and, and we had him do, he, he is a very, very, very good instruction designer. I mean, very thorough very efficient, can take a model, break it down, and know exactly how it needs to be put back together in an order that I don't think I would be able to do myself. Um, so I, 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 um, 
I engaged him to do the the remainder of the the six the, the six other models that we did, uh, and and just they came out spectacular. Uh, I'm not exactly certain what he uses, um, uh, but uh, I think uh, there was a tool out there that I used for the first three, and I'm trying to remember not so long ago. I'm trying to remember what it was. Anyway, there was a gentleman overseas, I think in the UK um, or in Europe somewhere, that developed a Java-based program um, that highlighted each individual piece. And we contacted him and asked him if we could use it. And he said, absolutely, go for it, do it. So the instructions between the two series of, of ships are a bit different. But um, uh, just, a, just a very, very interesting education in, in how that works. I don't know how else to say it. Well, now remember, I do I did instructions for a thirty four thousand piece Lego set. So Ugh. been there, done that. I can't imagine. No, it was. Yeah, and I wasn't done when we got to Seattle. And no, you were. Basically, I was on the computer for how long to get that done? Well, that's about good. two three o'clock every night. Yeah, amazing. We've been up at six seven to get there for eight so yeah <laughs> yeah and i spent uh i spent the better part of a year working on the uh the lut um instructions and that took i mean that's 1200 pages wow that's huge huge eight thousand eight thousand six hundred pieces in the in the final version Amazing. I don't think, I mean, we had a couple of books, like one or two books for some of the models we had, but they were never larger than 80 pages a piece. Um, so, so nothing to that scale, but we did, you know, we did get up there into the multi thousand piece set. Um, very interesting. Um, you know, one of the things that I think we found and, and I'm sure you guys know is, you know, making these things affordable is very, very difficult. In fact, we don't make, enough money off of each set to buy ourselves a cup of coffee at Starbucks. And, you know, that's why I think Scott was alluding to being a labor of love early on is you're just doing it because you want to see it done and you want to get it out there. Um, but yeah. Uh, so just a little more detail on that. Uh, Brick Vibe, that Bricklink store became our service provider. And so they did all the kidding for brick formation. So that was under the, under the oversight of, of Dominic and, and Justin. Um, and, uh, you know, it worked out pretty well. Um, you know, obviously, you're going through it the first time. You, you, you refine your processes and you get better over time. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a good experience. I'm glad we did it. And, uh, yeah, yeah it was, it's, it's been a lot of fun so far. Is the second part of that do it again? <laughs> I'm sorry? Is the second part of that statement, been there, done that, never do it again? Or? <sighs> well, if, if you're asking... <laughs> I, I have a I have a trademark out there right now that I'm working on, um, and I've been experimenting with my own um, with my own prototypes. So we'll we'll see what comes of that. Um, why don't I, Why don't I just leave it at that? Okay. Okay. Will you announce it on my show at some point? If you would like me to, I certainly can. If it comes to fruition, <laughs> yes, absolutely. You keep me informed, and we'll, we'll make. That I'll happen. show you a preview later on. How's that? And okay. then you can decide if you want it on your show. <laughs> oh no! No, no, no! It's it's all good. It's all good. I uh, yeah, I know. It's it is a labor of love, and it's um, yeah. I don't know. It's it's very hard to determine when to stop. That's the. I was I was under the assumption that it was a never stop sort of thing. Well, I, I kind of dived in a little too far to stop right now, so it's. I think it's I think it's the creationism that doesn't stop. Yeah. Different efforts, the creationism doesn't stop, right? Well, and I like that you had people that helped you with the, um, the, the packaging and stuff because I got to do that all myself, right? So right. I designed. Well, so, so for the brand, yes. For the artwork and everything behind that, I did a lot of that on my own. Okay. Um, 
So, so you know, taking taking in game screenshots of the backgrounds of space and overlaying them with, um, you know, uh, shots of the of the of the models. That's that's very time consuming. Using Premiere Pro to do um, you know 360 degree video of each of the models to show them off. Um, they're out there on the YouTube channel. You know, for brick formation, if you want to go ahead and take a look at them. Um, they're also on our Facebook page and on our website. Not that I'm plugging brick formation, but you know. Since we're talking, I still have a few set. So I just started. Um, I order a lot, so I'm, I'm sure. Um, in fact, just this last month, well, I've been doing my books this morning, so I really know how much I buy. Uh, <laughs> but um, I just started with uh, Brick Vibe, and um, it, I don't know. It was it was weird. I got one shipment from them and they mix together um black two by twos and two by and one by twos hmm. and that was not fun I, I don't know what to say to that <laughs> what i can say is that you know they're they're the they're the <laughs> they're the provider um but yeah no uh i know they have a tremendously diverse uh, you know, number of elements and volume of them. You know, I, I haven't, I suppose I haven't purchased anything from them in quite some time because everything that we were doing was specialty together, right? We had a contract relationship in place. So it's, right, right. it's, it's not, not like a, 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 a fall out there just doing regular consuming. Um, you know, there was a science behind it for them to get us uh, the pieces that they had in stock and pieces they didn't have and order them for the least amount of money that they could. And, you know, there was a lot of, lot of back-end engineering that they did to go into that. Um, so, and I think that, I think that uh, one of the things that they're, you know, trying to do is, is grow themselves as a service provider as well, right? So Brick Formation would not be the only kidding company that, um, that they'd be working with. They'd be working with others as well, um, including, um, you know, and I, I shouldn't speak for them, but being what they what they did for Brick Formation was when they put together a store, right? They have a storefront, they have a website, um, and and uh, all of that is configurable off of sets um, that you can uh, that you can provide to them, and and they can load up. So, uh, yeah, very very uh, you know. So if if you're ever thinking about you know taking an adventure down that road, um, there's certainly someone that uh, you know you might be able to work with. I don't, um, yeah, because again, I do this all myself. Um, yeah, you're, you're well established though, right? You have your own sites, you have everything. Well, um, yeah, except purchasing brick is still a huge deal. Um, sure. And one of the things I've noticed is I buy enough now that I have, I can affect the market. Um, <laughs> and, and in fact, so you're the I reason have, the piece price goes up. Yeah. And I, um, I had to change the design of my Saturn V because of that. And, yeah. and I've got another version of, um, not a version, but I'm working with Rob Kleinschmidt at Brick Stuff to do a light launch version of my Saturn V. So uh, he's kind of worked up the lighting part of it, and now I'm going to work up the brick so that it'll be one one of the things that we really had to be sensitive of was you know as you're designing what parts can you use what's there what's affordable and if a part you know that provides a specific shape to make something more accurate um is in use is it worth it to raise the price of a set yeah you know, no, there, I there's, a, there, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of thought that has to go into, you know, the analysis of, of your model once you've completed something and how do you refine that and how can you make it look the same using other pieces that are more readily available. And that, that is the hardest part in doing your own. And it's not just yeah. cost base. It is not just cost right. base. I've, I've, I've hit some things that have, um, that the cost is reasonable, but the availability is shit. Um, yep. And by that, I mean, I cannot order 
Uh, any store may only have five of them or 10 of them. Right. And so that's a whole tertiary level. Um, yeah. And that's one nice thing about Studio. It does allow you to kind of price check it rapidly while you're building. There is a gauge, then, right? Yep. But then yep. you have to go from the next part. And that's where I look at every single part, unless I've used it a bunch. Sure. So I know it and see how many stores have it in quantity. And, and, and then you have to look at your shipping cost from those yep. stores, right? Well, to see how much more expensive it's really going to be to procure all of those parts. <laughs> and now how well, many models yeah. can I make to cover the cost of what I'm paying for for all of that? And if you go international, that's 30 bucks right there, right? Oh, no. At a start. Um, which I had to do one. And luckily, because I don't know why, but so this has become the current part that's hard to get. It's just a four by four round brick. Oh, right. And uh, so I looked at quantities and there was somebody in Yugoslavia that had like 300 of them. So I just, yeah. got them, you know, because we'll they're only going to go up in price, right? Right, right. But the, the uh, five tall cylinder halves. I bought every one in the United States that was priced under a dollar. And then oh, that's why I couldn't find any. Yeah, exactly. And I had somebody make a comment to that effect to me, uh, more than one person. Uh, <laughs> but it's like all of a sudden, and then I made an offer. There was somebody else that had, they wanted $2.70 each, and they had 300 of them. And I offered him a $1.20. And he chose to not. Yeah. And that's the uh, same problem with the, uh, yeah, I mentioned it before, the, those red fence pieces. Sure. The, uh, you got to think about a printed brick. I. Yeah, I'm, I'm really considering it. But... Again, I have two LUTs. I'm not going to build another one. People are still buying my instructions. Whatever. <laughs> so is there room for collaboration? Is that what we're saying? Yeah, sure. You say you don't want to build another one. How about one that's 12 feet tall? <laughs> um, <laughs> nope. Okay, I'm just trying to suppress the one part of my brain going, yes, do it. Yes, yes do it. Do it. Well, let me finish my sixth design, then we'll talk. Yeah. Oh, I was going to tell you, you guys. The one that I still want to do, I don't know if I'll get around to it, is the uh, the Saturn 1B milk stool. Because they, uh, they launched Saturn 1Bs off of the same size tower, but they had like this extension stool on top of it so the smaller Saturn 1B could fit on it. And I've been playing around with it, and I just don't have the motivation to finish it. <laughs> I was going to tell you guys, and I think I mentioned this to you, Sam, because um, you deal with a huge model as well. And one of the things I've noticed is I'm really doing a lot of sub-models where I didn't do it before. Mm -hmm. And because if you do a – so I've got a couple of segments now because, you know, the Saturn V – is in uh, different segments. And some of these segments are about six to 7,000 brick. And by having each layer be a sub build, um, it, it's actually pretty easy to manipulate and edit. Um, the one thing I've noticed, and I'm trying to figure out what their coordinate system is in studio, but um, sometimes it's easier to move a huge piece by the three dimensions. And as best I can figure out, it's Y or it's X, Z, and Y when you bring up the dimensions. And, uh, but it's always to the top of the subassembly. And for some reason, Z is negative if you go up which to me is just 
yeah. as backwards. Um, but it, I've noticed that that's improved my ability to pull things together. And then I've figured out how to, um, I basically align by zero, zero, uh, X, Y, and then I can bring a piece in, get it on the top. Then I just have to get it to zero, zero to get it to align. So that is your tip du jour for studio for today. Yeah, I have a, one of, one of my builds I'm doing at the moment in studio, my, my TARDIS. Um, 1,150, 55 pieces now because I've managed to get rid of a load of one by ones. Um, no influence there, right? Yeah. But, you, um, you are definitely my Padawan. <laughs> but I can't, in studio, I can't get the roof sub model, if you will, to sit on top of the main thing. Um, <laughs> sit on top of me. That and, it's all, and it's all to do with going back to our earlier discussion about um, computer performance. <laughs> I just I haven't got anything that's got the, the clearly the required computing power to move the 300 odd bricks that are in that roof. Literally, two studs. That's, that's all <laughs> it needs to move, two studs over. <clears throat> well, try the so you go up, hover. It, make it a sub-assembly, go up, hover over it, and then you'll get one that's like a, a three-dimensional arrow and the other one's the rotation. Go to the three-dimension, click on it, and now it'll give you this, uh, again, it's X, Z, and Y. And you'll notice that the Z is negative because it's based on wherever your base is. Um but then the X and the Y that are on the two sides, if you've got it centered at zero. But the problem is, it's I cannot figure out what the number is. It's so, not like one plate. It's not like... Right. Um, I think you you do know you can just click on the submodel and you use WASD to move it by a stud or a third of a stud. Oh, really? I did not do this. Because that, that's how I, I move my models around is using WASD. If you hold like your commander uh, option key, you can move it by less than, what is it? Half a stud? It's yeah. the, a single digit when you look at the XYZ. You just change the size of your grid from full stud to uh, plate length and then whatever the smallest one like he's saying is. Right, well, I've now got my target, my roof on my TARDIS. Um, and it is, I'm just checking the bottom of it now to make sure it's all in line with the stuff I need it to be. Uh, yeah, so I'm actually going to show this now. <laughs> now you have to have a look at it. Okay. Uh oh, uh oh. Application uh, window. Ah. So, so this is my. Uh, this is my goddess. Yeah, and if I... And all I needed to do was literally move this over to studs because it was um, just off to literally the left. And having done that, it now sits perfectly all the way around. And uh, Sam, have you lowered your graphic settings to help with your performance? Yes, yeah, I did. I lowered it right down. That was one of the first things I did to try and get it across. Um, so I thought, if I lower it down, then maybe I'm going to have more of a chance. Okay. Um, so I did that at the same time. But, um, yeah. Hmm. Have, you changed, have you changed your max frame rate? No. Probably. No, I haven't. It's in that uh, menu. Yeah. It's a trick someone told me. A while ago. Okay. If you go I'll to the after the um, after the cool, I don't want it to freak <laughs> my ass out anymore. Well, and save it too, right? Yeah, that's a good point. I should save this. <laughs> Control F. 
Do you, I really want a shortcut for uh, uh, placing a new origin? Oh, yes. I, I, that's one of the first things I ever did. What's Yo, that? You make one? What? Are you able to make one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, man. I made mine X. Yeah, I made mine Z. Oh, I see it now. Oh, now we're turning this into a yeah. <laughs> recording advice section. How, well, because studio is so well documented, don't you know? Art studio, yeah. yeah. That Facebook group I just joined is helping out a lot. Yeah, I need to get more active. So, um, so I, I, I feel like I'm missing out. I actually have two uh, digital models to sh share as well if we're up for uh, showing tell. Since we're all uh, showing off Have you work. used it at all, Aaron? Have you used Studio? I have. I have. I like it as a tool. I, I you know, I, I did graduate to that to some degree um, uh, more recently within the last year or so after it matured a bit more. I do like it. It's a powerful tool for sure. Um, I haven't designed anything in it uh, recently, recently, but uh, within the last few months. What is your uh, What is your preference? Uh, in, in terms of tools, now, yeah, certainly studio, it. certainly studio for sure. Okay. For sure. But you, um, do you mostly just uh, just build things as you go, or design as you build? Uh, so I, I, you're talking about workflow. So what yeah. I, I'm, I guess I've, have I really built anything that's original? No. So for me, you know, my, my workflow is, is I have studio up on a screen or LDD on a screen, you know, and in, in, in the other, I'm, I'm referencing size of whatever it is I'm building pictures, et cetera. So I try and gauge that scale there, put some shapes together. And then when I when I when I get to something I like, um, and, and I usually try to pick out the most detailed or the most difficult part of the model that would be to shape with brick or element Lego elements, and then go from there. Uh, and and that kind of becomes my scale, if you will. Now that it's, that that that's how I did the land speeder. That's how I did the destroyer and that that saucer. But what? Doing the brick formation models was a real challenge. Um, I did the same thing, but I had to make them smaller in scale. So I'd have Homeworld up on one screen, I'd have Studio up on the other, you know, windowed Homeworld, paused in space, you know, taking a look at whatever ship it was in 3D space and, and trying to tackle it like that. And that's how I that's how I build. Um, uh, yeah. Homeworld. Yep. Yep. So I'm, I'm pretty. I'm. I'm a, I guess you would call it what you call a referencer. I guess I don't know if that's a term, as far as workflow, but um, that, that's what I do. Referencer. Yeah. Like that. You know, Scott. Scott, I should probably say. You know, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, uh, for both the land speeder and and the the brick formation stuff. Joe Menno uh, at at Brick Journal has has been phenomenal. He's he's published some of that. You know, he published the land spirit and he published brick formation stuff. Um, I think you know him personally. Uh, really, really good guy. Um, he is. And, and I really like what he does for the community of Lego. He's uh, yeah. pretty awesome. Anyway, so I'd throw that out there for Joe. I think is um, Sam, have you done, um, Mr. Bedford, have you done anything with Joe yet? What do you mean exactly? Well, Joe, Joe Mano, not, not Joe Mano. Yeah, Joe Mano, sorry. Yeah. Yep. Mm -mm, I don't know him. Yeah. Mr. Chambers, that might be a good thing to, to try and do. introduce yeah. Sam to Joe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should. Um, he, he runs Brick Journal, and I did a... Uh, I did an article with him, was it September of last year? Um, just showing off my original um, Skylab LUT. Um, yeah, he's a fun guy. 
He is. Yep. Good, all right. good, good person all around. Yeah. He's been on the show as well. Yes. And, uh, I saw so that on the show. That was, what was that? It was uh, episode number two, I believe. May, thor May 3rd. May 3rd. Yeah. He, um, he, he was building a kit from, well, a, a really old one. Older than me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't it like a... Did you say it was the 60s or the 50s? It was... Or, <laughs> oh, 60s. I think it was, 60s. 60s. I think it was 60s, yeah. Oh, it's probably geez. older than most of us. It was a, it you it said was most a, of us is this where you're jabbing the thorn into the side of somebody in that other <laughs> picture here. Bye bye, Pete. You know what? No one's... Uh, I'm not exactly anything. young myself, so. Um. <laughs> uh, you still don't win. I win that one still. Probably. So, um, whilst whilst we've been chatting, we've had a, I don't know if you guys know um, know this YouTube channel, but uh, brother from another brick um, does, he does a lot of reviews and uh, stuff on. YouTube relate into Lego. Um, it's popped by to say hello. So, oh, uh, cool. say howdy or hi. Yeah, uh, BFAB. I think he's in uh, Minnesota. Ah, okay. So he's not far from me then. Minnesota? No. Minnesota. Uh, yeah, I've been following him for about a year now. He's a really nice guy. Is my uh, screen sharing working, or is it? We see a picture uh, of you. Yeah, we see I, I can see your screen in the bottom window, but it's oh, it's uh, a picture. It's basically the Streamyard screen. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Yeah, oh, that's, oh, that's freaky. So this is a mini build I did this week. Uh, uh, wrong uh, screen. <laughs> Uh, no, it's not showing. Hey guys, I, I'm real sorry. I gotta head out right now, but um, okay, I, I gotta run. But okay, it was great Thank meeting you, you Aaron. Good to see, you. see you, Sam. Sam, bye, Joe. Scott, see ya. Bye, Joe. Come back in out. two weeks. Yeah, I will. I'll be back. Okay, <laughs> hey guys, Hello. thanks. See ya. Bye, Joe. I think I fixed it now. Okay. It's still showing the screen with. Oh, there it is. Yeah, cool. There you go. Oh, very nice. So, yeah. Just, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> uh, I'm having trouble with uh, getting my decals to show up correctly on your horror's legs. Um, just because uh, it's, as you can see, I'm trying to get this to match up, and every time I try to do it in their part designer, it's not working. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that'll take some refinement. So that was just a small little original series build. Um, Wh which episode was that? Uh, City on the Edge of Forever. All right. right yeah. It's the uh, one with the Iconian Gateway, isn't it? Very cool. Basically, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this is the big one I've been working on for the past week oh, and a half. Yeah. I that. almost have it finalized, and then I have a ton of decals to build in Photoshop. Um, really happy with the uh, um, glass walkway, catwalk I did around the warp core. In the show, oh. this is uh, actually an octagon. And yeah. No way I was going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I couldn't think of a way to even make that even possibly work with the glass pieces. Um, and of course, this actually extends all the way around, but I chose to edit it just because I wanted to make the make it more viewable. Sure. Um, this, I think I could do better building physically because I, I kind of want this to end up reaching this second floor here, but I'm still happy with this curved wall I built that has panels. 
And then I also included the blast door because I want to make a play feature to make this. I want to make a gear system so this can go up and down. Uh, have you got a little Jordi LaForge minifigure that can do his duck and roll underneath it? Precisely. You uh, yeah. <laughs> know exactly what I was going with there. So that that's definitely going to be on the box art. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, nice. Surprisingly, and I think uh, kind of like what Aaron was talking about earlier, I started this build here with this table here and making sure it was minifig scale. There was enough logic between that and the wall, and then basically everything was built off of that. I started with this room and then worked my way back here. Hmm. Very, cool. Uh, Very cool. Yeah, these are technically uh, doors, so I'm debating on whether or not if I want to put them on tiles so they can slide open or not. But as of right now, they're just brick. But uh, And it's just going to be a nice complimentary set. I think I showed this last time, but my holodeck I built the other week. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. The door uh, is perfect, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. The only problem is this piece right here this uh, inverted arch does not yeah. come in this color. Hey, uh, I'm gonna t I'm gonna tell you right now. You, you know, there were colors that you know, when I did that land speeder and I submitted it to Ideas, they noted that color wasn't an issue. So I actually painted pieces. Really? I did. I I I I, I and and I, I could not find the color tan that matched the tan that Lego had. So I had to color match it. And, and the only place that could do it, I went to paint stores, I went to hardware stores. The only place that got it right was Home Depot. And <laughs> I took that, I diluted it down and turned a latex match into a sprayable paint. And that's how I did those parts. Because that, that front end where you have the, and I, I don't know what the dimension is, the large um, uh, saucer slopes, the quarter, the, the, the quarter, uh, quarter yeah. round saucer slope. Um, those, are those, right. yeah, those don't come in the tan that that um, I needed. They only come in the dark tan, I think. And so I had to spray the four pieces to get them um, the right color. So don't be afraid to do that if you need. Just okay. <laughs> I know it's not purist, but um, it worked for me. So. I definitely, I think I'm actually going to build this one physically. Okay. Um, and... Uh, and I have that color combination if you want it. Okay. <laughs> Let me know. I, I would definitely uh, want to check that out. Sure. <clears throat> and, uh, but yeah, I, I'm just going to see how many rooms can I make on the Enterprise because um, uh, I'm afraid to even attempt a ship build just because it's like I feel like Star Trek ships are so hard to do since they're so curvaceous and smooth. Yeah. Right. I, I've got, a a question. I've got a question for you guys, and this may be heresy, but how did you feel about the Star Trek series that that Mega did? I've been looking at them, and the I think the best model they have is the original series Enterprise. Yes. And the Klingon Battlecruiser. Yep. I, the I other models are pretty bad, in my opinion. Yeah. No, I, I, very interesting. I, I happen to. My father is a tremendously huge Trekkie from the original series because that was his that was his thing when he was young, uh, or younger. And um, I decided for for one year for his birthday and Father's Day to get him every one of those sets, and he happily put them all together. It was kind of my introduction to him back into building something, you know, regardless of what it was, because he used to help me build, you know, when I was a kid, and. Um, it's funny because as we went along with doing brick formation, he was one of my test builders. So he was building the things I was creating later on, which was kind of an interesting turn. Um, so did you wear a mask when you bought those sets? <laughs> <laughs> well, this been, was a few years back. But. <laughs> I've been looking at the Enterprise one on eBay, and it's over $200. And... I'm trying to debate if I should spend that much on non-Lego. Well, so so I know that Amazon had them for seventy-five dollars a couple of years ago. Yeah, I don't and know if they're out of production. 
now. So. Yeah, okay. All right. All right. But uh, I, I downloaded the instructions for them, and I'm like, oh, I'm just going to build this in Lego. And then I quickly found out um, Mega Blocks has a lot of pieces that don't exist in Lego. They do. They do. They have a one by three modified plate that basically offsets the uh, stud yeah. instead of using like a modified one by two jumper plate. And I'm like, that's very interesting. And they, I also noticed they had a lot of bricks that had studs on both sides. So you could build in both directions. Yeah. Kind of a, a snot, a snot variation. Wow. It goes, it goes against the grain of what we're used to for sure. Right. Yeah. And then I quickly realized, well, I can't build this in Lego exactly. So if I, I could modify the design. Right. Right. So I, I, I I, I like building in general. Um, I'm not really married to a particular medium, right? Although most of what I've done is, is in Lego. Um, admittedly, I did, I, I, I have um, the Masters of the Universe uh, Castle Grayskull sitting <laughs> in a room next door just because I used to like those when I was a kid and I thought, well, that'd be fun to build one day. I haven't gotten around to it. I did pick one. Actually, my, Bethany, my wife, got, got one for my birthday. I think last year. So I will probably have to go and build that. <laughs> For sure. So, so anyway, Scott's never going to have me on a show again because I, I brought up Mega Construct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, Peter, a couple of comments for you there based on your builds uh, from a chap called Isaac Wilder. Uh, he says your first one, which I believe was the Guardian uh, the on the surface, but he said that was a cool little build. <laughs> and he also likes your engineering for TNG wow. as well. Thank you. So and, big uh, praise. Hopefully, I can get get them built for a uh, public display next year. Hopefully, we'll be have a chance to publicly display. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's why I was being optimistic with next year. <laughs> so, you, tell me, catch me up on Iowa Lug. Oh well, well, obviously, we haven't been meeting that I'm aware of. You know, and. Admittedly, with everything that I was doing with brick formation, um, all of my weekends were consumed. Right. So I, it, it, it's been very – I have not been a regular participant like I had in the past. Um, and that's a really kind of a sad thing. I, I did – we there was a plan to go to Brickworld, I think, last year uh, to do a space build um, together, a collaborative build. I did build something small for that, but it ultimately ended up too many people were, were unable to go. And I think that was the last, the last effort I was involved with. It's, it's really too bad. Um, and that's really on me. So I, I got to be honest with you. I couldn't tell you what the current state is at the moment and okay. what they're doing today. And now, you know, I, I, I know that you, you advertise this in the Facebook space for them. Uh, they're probably going to be very disappointed that I said that. <laughs> or maybe not. Maybe they won't be disappointed. Maybe they don't. <laughs> well, and then, you know, it's funny that it, I've been gone long enough that I felt I needed to explain who I was. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks for posting that out there, by the way. It was very kind of you. So what, what would you like to do next? I mean, it sounds like brick formations kind of fading. Um, what are you, what would you I, like to do next? I do have something I'm working on. I would love to apply it to Lego, but I don't think from an affordability perspective, it will not work. It needs to be something that's large scale. It needs to be something that's modular. Um, and, and like I said, I'll, I'll share what it is with you, um, uh, after the show, uh, one-on-one, -on -one, if that's all right. Um, yeah. uh, but, uh, uh, with with the kind of the foray I'm getting into with doing some 3D printing and prototyping, um, I really have a different direction I feel like I'm going to take. So it's gonna it's, I'm gonna keep on going with the creationism. Um, whether or not this would lead to a line of elements that 
that could be used somewhere else, I don't know, but it can certainly be applied to what I'm working on. And um, they, they, they are certainly a, there's certainly a customized um, element, not not like your traditional ones that Lego and Mega have, um, and, and other brands too, right? Because there are other brands out there. You've got Kobe and you've got a number of others. Um, it, it would be something completely, I won't say different, but definitely unique. So that, that's kind of where I'm going. That's my direction. Um, I'm not gonna stop building in Lego, right? I mean, there's always a set that I'm gonna wanna want, I'm sure. Um, but uh, it's good. It, with this and the, it is a, the, the amount of time that it's taken and consumed to get it to where it is um, over the last few months, um, that, that's, that's my focus. So I, I guess I won't say I'm, I'm leaving the brick built community per se. Um, I'm just changing course a little bit from, I guess, the community that Lego provides. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of, um, it, you know, I guess I've decided that this is my medium, you know, so I've, I'm, I'm like beyond committed, I think, or I should be committed, one or the other. Um, but um, yeah, I, I'd like to get more in the corporate world. Um, I really enjoy my corporate gigs. And, sure. but I think I'm underused in that, um, like with the mud pump, I had suggested that, why don't you fly me down to Dallas, which was where their headquarters were, put me in a room with a camera and your lead engineer on the mud pump. And then for an hour, I'd show him how I did, how I made the model teach him how to build it and then ask him questions about why it's the best mud pump in North America, whatever, you know, yeah. and, um, and because of my engineering background and curiosity, I think it could be a really fun way to engage their clientele or their client base. And, sure. but like identifying how the heck do I find the people that, arrange or make that kind of thing happen you know it's not like there's not a clear definition of what that kind of person or firm is you know and it, it, it's a tough thing to communicate but i'd really love to do it so get, getting getting the name out there to a broader audience through bills yeah yeah and the Saturn oh, fly, I gotta admit, it's been um, it's good marketing, right? It's it's a great, yeah. I mean, I tell marketing. you what, you walk into a room, you can't miss it. You got it. And just the process too, the uh, I had to use every ounce of project uh, <laughs> management that you can imagine, you know, it's oh, like no. Uh, you know, and then add in that your your main workforce are kids. Yeah. And it, you know, it, it's interesting going through the process of, of building something against intellectual property. Yeah. You know, um, as we did brick formation, right? There, there was a process that we went through. We deciding what to do, right? What do we do? Which which ships are we going to provide? What what looks good? We got feedback, surveyed, you know, the, the community. We talked with the development team. We talked with um, uh, just, just a number of different people to get an idea of what, what ships do you like? What do you think makes sense? What are the fan favorites? Those kinds of things. So getting to that stage is, is I won't say it's easy, but it, 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 it comes, it comes in short time. It wasn't something that took us a long time. And then, you build the design against the ship. You know, how closely can you replicate this at a low cost, still make it look like it needs to with the least amount of pieces. Right. And then, and then you go and you get that approved and hopefully they like it. And then once it's approved, right, does it meet their standard? You refine that design in the best possible way. 
and then move forward on sourcing. But you also have to make sure during the time of design that you can source those pieces, which we kind of talked about earlier, in an, in an effective and, and uh, cost, well, cost-effective manner. And, and then there's, okay, now we've, we've got all of that approved and we have all the pieces. Let's make sure we can count them out, get them in a box, and build instructions against what we're doing. Building the instructions, getting the instructions in the box, getting the pieces in the box, completing the box art, getting it back to the licensor, having the licensor appreciate what you've put together, hopefully the first time. You know, um, and then have them go through and build it and make sure everything works. And and um, it is a process that that can be can be hit or miss sometimes because yeah. you know what it's like when you're you're you know you, you the, the the review phases can be tough. We didn't have too many too many issues with what we produced. Uh, it actually went fairly smooth with us or for us with them. Um, the developers were behind it. And they they really really. The development team was behind it, and they really, really liked the models, which was which was a benefit for us. Um, and as a matter of fact, one of the models that we did uh, was from uh, 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 the Deserts of Karak, which was a prequel to the to the original game itself, and and um, just one that was Pierre Kruger's um, base runner, which is a little car that runs in the desert, not little actually in scale to a person. It's absolutely tremendously huge. Um, but they 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 liked what they they saw as well, and, and we got we got lucky. Um, there was only one model I think that we had a little bit of problem with where we had to go back to the drawing board. So, but um, that process is huge. Sorry, I've probably babbled on way too long about the process. No, no, and that I I have obviously because of the the market I'm in, um, I'm either working for the person that owns the IP, mm -hmm. so. Um, you know, I don't have to worry about it at that point, but um, I've really avoided anything licensed. And like we discussed, I, I would love to do a, a micro version of the Crude Dragon, but I'm worried about the IP of the SpaceX logo. Um, right. Drop a note to Elon. I'm sure he'll let you do it. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, <laughs> It's, you know, as brilliant a, as a guy as he is, he sure is a jerk. <laughs> now I'm going to have to edit that part out because he watches this. <laughs> after you tweet yes, him. Right. I say that in all love, Elon. So. That I was fun to watch, though. Can You know, the... It was fun to feel pride again. Yeah, it is something. It's nice, nice to, nice to kind of get back into, you know, uh, so, someone that has the passion for for space flight. That's it's awesome, for sure. Well, and his crew, you know, obviously, uh, we all stand on the shoulders of thousands and thousands of incredibly competent people, and. Uh, he, you know, he's got a crew. He he gets too much credit for it, but you know that he has also invested an awful lot of time and money to to make the thing work. Um, he's he's certainly the face of, you know. Yeah, yeah. and but um, I just like the fact, you know. I mean, I think it showed everyone in a really good light. I mean, I think NASA came off very well. I think. Um, you know, obviously SpaceX and their crew did too. So sure. um, I guess that's when I think of pride, I just felt that that was seemed like, you know, kind of same thing with Spaceship One. You know, I think um, that whole thing, and it's really sad the setback they've had uh, with Spaceship Two, but I think they're going to get over it and they're doing glider tests now. So hopefully they'll be back in track um soon yeah they had a successful test yesterday actually was it, it wasn't a glide test i think yeah, yeah it was a glide test from fifty thousand. um yeah it all went very successfully they were all very happy and very very cheerful after it so yeah very good i have a funny story we um 
dad and I went to Oshkosh one year and uh, Spaceship One showed up and we happened to be there when it landed. Um, and of course it's landing, it's hung under the white night one. Mm. And it was on its way to Dulles to be donated to the Smithsonian. And they timed it so that they would land at the fly-in. And then that night they had a really cool um, discussion between um, the X-15 pilot um, who's now dead and I'm spacing on his name, Scott Carpenter. And then not Scott Carpenter, he was the astronaut. Um, and the, the main pilot of Spaceship One, um, who unfortunately also died. I think he was the one that died in um, the Spaceship Two accident. But um, anyway, they had this great question and answer series, and they were talking about flying the white night, night um, from Arizona. And it was funny, they hit, um, I can't remember where they hit, and Garmin was one of their main sponsors. And all of a sudden their maps disappeared. This was back at the time where you had to buy the maps and upload them, you know. Yeah. And of course the White Knight one had never been outside Arizona. And so, <laughs> so they <laughs> any maps. And so, you know, uh, luckily they the flight path went right through um, Lenexa, Kansas. So they just landed and Garmin totally redid the, you know, the upload for them. And because uh, they definitely wanted to showcase their glass cockpit when they got to uh, Oshkosh. So, but I thought that was funny that basically one of the most advanced airplanes on the planet was VFR for half of its flight from Arizona. Just, which yeah, I don't I, need maps, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, we don't need no stinking. Yeah, you know, we'll just fly low enough we can see the highways. So uh, the kind of there wants to uh, wants to know if uh, anyone's going to be attending Brickworld Virtual today. I have not yet. I have not yet. Well, they've got. Any? I'm not going to be unfortunately. No, they've got lots of stuff on from the looks of it. Looking at their timetable, but I know I Kevin Hinkle has done. He's hosted some rooms and stuff like that. So I know I advertised it one of the last ones they did. Mm. They're kind of doing it on a weekly basis. I think it's Saturdays. Okay. That's a good thing. I like that. Mm. Um, well, we're getting down to it. I it's funny, my countdown clock didn't show. Did yours? Sam? Yes, mine, mine, mine's still going. Huh. Why is mine just anyway? Um, so yeah, we're within two minutes. So um, I, I want to thank you. I guess I should put the camera on. <laughs> there. Um, thank you very much, Aaron, for joining us. It's been this great. Fun. Yeah, it, was, it was a pleasure being here. Please know that you're always welcome. You'll be on my um, Brick Building Together Apart email. So usually the Friday before the episode, I send it out so everybody kind of has a link that uh, might join us. So feel free at any time. Very good. Um, keep me appraised of what you're doing. and I Will do, absolutely. And ditto, please. Part of it. Um, if I ever decide to build a kit that costs over $100, I will call you. <laughs> hopefully get you to talk me out of it okay um, <laughs> or if i need help negotiating because frankly having you in the room um is w would be of assistance because you're a um i don't want to say not imposing but i did want to show as the last image um somebody's alter ego oh boy I think I know where he pulled these pictures from. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And I've never seen somebody wear it quite as good as you do. Um, you <laughs> so that that the the Batman was at Brickworld Chicago. I can't remember if that was 2015, 2016, or 2017. I think it was 2015 or 2016. But that the the picture on the right, um, that was uh, what I wore to my wedding. <laughs> yeah. I wore that. I wore that under my my tux. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you 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 know what? You're the one guy in the world that can just pull that off, right? Well, so, say, so that's very kind yeah. of you, and I'm flattered. Yeah. Others so, may uh, may think differently, but uh, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I bet I, I bet Bethany's okay with it. I'm okay. just saying, but yeah. I um, kind of thought uh, Bruce Wayne would or Batman would wear the tux under the. Bad oh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Right? <laughs> um, and just a little advertisement in two weeks, um, Mr. Bedford will be our guest. So I will get that going pretty soon. So um, he's going to showcase more of his uh, L39 work that he's been doing. And we'll learn more about um, how this musician turned into a <laughs> um, a, a virtual brick builder. Um, that'll be a lot of fun to uh, learn more about. So again, thanks everybody. And uh, we will see you in two weeks. Thanks guys. All right. Bye. See, you, see ya.